Maplewood police officers support special athletes year-round. On today's show, we'll take a look at how their hard work is paying off. High school students are heading into the deadliest days of driving. We'll talk with an expert about what parents can do to protect their children. I'm Carrie Crotty. And I'm Lon Bakey. Welcome to your police report. A motorist is almost 20 times more likely to die in a crash involving a train than a crash with another car. About eight people are hit by a train every day in the United States. Our crew hitched a ride to show you just what it looks like from the conductor's seat. We hit a vehicle that was parked too close to the tracks. Other than that, not yet. Well, it's kind of a matter of time from what everybody says. Joe Stryford has been driving trains for 12 years. He and Chad Hedeen worked together for Twin Cities and Western Railroad Company. One drives and the other conducts. It's a system that works well on the inside, but it's what drivers do on the outside that puts them at risk. The lady that ran into us, she was messing around on her phone, she was speeding, and she had her, her kid in the back seat. It really makes you think when the parents in front are going across, and then you see the little kids looking up in the back, they don't have any control over that. Or the parents are talking on the phone, and they're just kind of looking up at you. Sometimes you get that close that you'll see them. The train collides with the car a person every three hours in the United States. 96% of deaths are the result of highway rail grade crossings or trespassing. But train engineers have little recourse. If a driver is distracted, impatient, and rolls the dice, they need to keep in mind a big train can take a mile to stop. We do believe that a large majority of these incidents are preventable, and that's why we are here. That's why we do what we do. Cheryl Cummings is the executive director of Minnesota Operation Lifesaver. The organization promotes the slogan, See Tracks, Think Train. We want it to become something that's just as automatic as putting on your seatbelt when you get in the car. Cumming says impatience, inattention, and ignorance are the main causes of collisions. As part of their educational mission, Minnesota Operation Lifesaver volunteers travel throughout the state providing free presentations. It's not just about your life or your one minute that you're saving because you're trying to get across those tracks before the train comes. Um, the reality is that it affects a lot of people. Railroad crossings include passive and active signs. The cross buck indicates it's legal to cross, but drivers must yield to trains. And active warnings include arms, flashing lights, bells, and whistles. Safety officials urge people to heed the warnings. Your impatience or inattention can change someone else's life forever. When you're new, that's one of the first things you're going to ask. Well, have you ever hit anybody? Because obviously you're in a large vehicle and you want to know. Yeah. Um, but generally, like a lot of the guys, especially if they've hit somebody, they generally don't want to talk about it. Yeah, because it's a very helpless feeling. I don't think they're thinking about the train. They're thinking about where they're going and how the three seconds late that they're going to be if they have to stop and wait for them. Operation Lifesaver, which began in 1972, also provides education to law enforcement about staying safe around the tracks while on the job. To learn more, check out their website. A portion of Highway 36 is now the Sergeant Joseph Bergeron Memorial Highway. Sergeant Bergeron was shot and killed on May 1, 2010. The portion of the highway is within the city limits of Maplewood. Sergeant Bergeron will be remembered this month along with the other men and women killed in the line of duty at our nation's capital. Coming up, we'll tell you why it is such a deadly time for teens.
like, okay, this time I'm going to do it. I'm going to actually go to school. Tell me about some of the stuff you've had to deal with. I just dropped out completely. I just got caught up in it, the whole scene with the alcohol and the drugs. I was arrested. A lot of my friends, they were really concerned, especially my friend Aaron. You just have to find someone. They don't have to tell you advice. They don't have to do that. They just listen. Give your friends the boost they need to graduate. Join us at BoostUp.org. Welcome back. More than 30 teenagers die in car crashes every year in Minnesota, and prom marks the start of the 100 deadliest days for teenagers behind the wheel. Cordy Pearson from the Minnesota Office of Traffic Safety is here to give us and parents some helpful advice. Welcome, Gordy. Thanks Welcome. for joining us. Thank you. What are the 100 deadliest days for teens? Well, starting right now about prom season is when the time period begins where the teens are at greatest risk as well as all other drivers and, and roadway users of being in a crash, a fatal crash or serious injury crash because they have more discretionary time. It's ultimately the beginning of the summer months when people have extra time and they're on the roads more often. Sure. What are the biggest risk fast, uh, factors for the teens? Well, risk factors for teens primarily involve their inexperience. Even though parents believe that their teens might be experienced drivers, it takes several years to gain the uh, expertise of handling a vehicle uh, skillfully and safely over time. So that inexperience uh, and working along the lines of the idea that they are teens, that they might have challenges as far as assessing risks and consequences, they're more likely to fall to peer pressure challenges like that, especially the young male drivers with a young male passenger. They're also less likely to buckle up than other age groups. So there's some factors there that really come into play when we're talking about teen drivers. Sure. Well, can you discuss a couple of the current teenage driver, driving laws? Sure. During the first six months of licensure, teens are allowed to have no more than one non-family teen passenger in the vehicle unless they have a parent in the vehicle with them. Uh, the teens that are in the vehicles with other teens have a tendency to be more of a distraction mm -hmm. uh, versus when you have an adult passenger in the vehicle, they act as another set of eyes and you know looking out for them. Sure. So they can only have one teen passenger in the vehicle without a parent in the vehicle. Also during that first six months, they can't drive unless they have a supervising adult driver in the vehicle with them between midnight and 5 a.m. I would suggest there's not much good going on <laughs> for a young teen <clears throat> between midnight and 5 a.m. anyway. Right. So for the second six months, that curfew, if you want to call it, is lifted, but then they're limited to having no more than three non-family teen passengers in the vehicle. Again, that's for the second six months of licensure. And of course, teens can't use cell phones when driving, and nobody can text while driving at all. Right. What are some things that the parents can do to ensure and enforce that their children are actually following the laws? Well, the first thing I would say is to have conversations with their teens, to discuss what the risks of teen driving are, what the laws are, and establish family rules that place safety as a priority over convenience. But monitor their teens and continue to work with their teens even after they're licensed. They still need supervision and they still need practice after they're licensed. Does the Office of Traffic Safety provide any educational or instructional materials? Uh, yes, we do. We have on our Office of Traffic Safety website, we do have resources for all sorts of different uh, traffic safety subjects, including uh, the parents of teen drivers. Also, we have a program called Point of Impact, which is a parent awareness program that's structured that driver educators in the state of Minnesota are required to offer parents to attend an hour and a half long class uh, and law enforcement is involved with those presentations typically and parents there will learn about the teen driving risks, what the laws are, 
how vital and important the parent role is in developing a safer teen driver, and then provide them with resources and information to fulfill that important role. My understanding is traffic crashes are the second leading cause of death in teens. Is there anything that we can do to help prevent that? Absolutely. It used to be that traffic crashes were the leading cause of death for teens, by the way, and the good news is that traffic crashes are going down uh, for teens as time okay. goes on. That's really good news. Mm -hmm. The bad news is that suicides have surpassed traffic crashes, and that's a, a sad statement to say. But the death of any young person is certainly a tragedy, no matter what the cause is. But there's a lot of things that parents can do and communities can do, and I, again, would suggest the first thing is to have discussions, conversations, and to have people learn about what the real risks of teen driving are, because they might have changed a little bit since the parents were mm -hmm. teens several <laughs> years ago. Uh, but having those conversations and establishing rules and following through with them and getting hours and hours and hours of supervised driving experience in different weather conditions, road conditions, et cetera, before the teen is out there licensed and trying to experience those uh, environments on their own is, is our suggestion. Do you have any final thoughts for us? Any other topics we didn't talk about? Well, just that I think that the role of the parents is such a critical thing there that um, some parents might think that a teen driver has a kind of a rite of passage just to let them go and to throw them the keys and say have a good time. Um, parents really need to, need to make decisions about their teen drivers that place safety as a priority over convenience. During prom and graduation time, parents should have a plan with their teens, an agreement that if the teen does get into a situation where they feel unsafe or they do need a ride home that they can call a parent and the parent will pick them up no questions you know right. ask necessarily or you know without yelling and screaming that sort of thing because it is inconvenient to be the parent of a teen driver there's no doubt about it but I can't think of anything more inconvenient than attending or planning my own teen's funeral right yeah absolutely I agree very well, well thank you very much for joining us Gordy great information yep thank you thank you sir <laughs> For more information on teen laws and helpful tips for parents, check out the Office of Traffic Safety's website. Coming up... Officers work year-round to raise money and awareness for a special group. We'll have the details after the break. In 1977 in Johannesburg, South Africa, an eight-year-old boy picked up the game of golf from his father. By the age of nine, he was already out playing him. The odds of this gentle lad winning the Junior World Golf Championships at the age of 14, one in 16 million. The odds of that same boy then making it to the US and European Pro Golf Tours, one in seven million. The odds of the Big Easy winning the Open Championship once and the US Open Championship twice, one in 780 million. The odds of this professional golfer having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 150. Ernie Else encourages you to learn the signs of autism at autismspeaks.org. Early diagnosis can make a lifetime of difference. Every year, Maplewood police officers, along with other law enforcement agencies, plunge, putt, and run to raise money and awareness for the Special Olympics of Minnesota. Now athletes are raising awareness about the use of the R word and during their spring games the message was heard loud and clear. The R word, I am talking about the word retard or retarded. Like me, I'm sure many of you have heard these words used in a negative manner either in school or in the community. that people with intellectual disabilities are either dumb or stupid. Spend just a minute with children who have special needs. Stupid. And the word stupid quickly disappears from one's vocabulary. Yes! Woo! 22 year old Abby Hirsch takes every opportunity 
to educate the uneducated about people with disabilities. She relishes her role as athlete, advocate, and ambassador for the Special Olympics of Minnesota. Let's hear it again for Abby Hirsch. Her passion for spreading the word to end the R word is paralleled only by her passion to compete. It was competing, after all, that drew her from her proverbial shell. The minute you get me in the water at first, I thought I couldn't do it because I was afraid to have water at my nose, but now I'm, I'm a great swimmer. I actually just came back actually swimming nationally in Princeton, New Jersey. That's the case with most special athletes. When given the opportunity to shine, they often discover their star burns bright. It gives them a new perspective on what some outsiders may call a disadvantage. If you haven't, you know, worked with this population of people, you know, don't be intimidated. They're they're great. They're so accepting and they're so fun. And um, I think everyone who volunteers, you just get a sense of um, the transformative nature of Special Olympics and how you know an athlete can come in just quiet and shy, and they can you know get a basketball, and their whole world can can change. And change their world it does. Being nice around deal. others with disabilities oh. gives them comfort yeah. and a sense of community. Oh community that supports them during the darker days, especially the days when they're called retarded. I can tell you from my experiences by hearing that word, and I've been, they actually threatened me at it more than once. It felt like a hot knife in my stomach and twisted. i just sick of that word. The R word is perhaps harder on parents of children with special needs than the kids themselves. Rochelle Tillerson believes people who use the word simply don't understand how hurtful it is. When I found out that our daughter was going to be born with Downs, I wasn't worried about the challenges. What I knew was going to be the hardest were the days that she came home from school crying because of what people said and did to her. And the R word is that is that's included. That was our first night where she came home crying. That was our first hit, and that that's been the hardest. Parent Leslie Cellini has coached her son Sean's basketball team for five years. Spread out guys, spread out, make sure you got somebody covered. She was 35 when she got pregnant with Sean. As is standard procedure for women of a certain age, doctors asked about genetic testing to detect Down syndrome. One, two, three, four! Along with her family, they decided they would not. They would accept what life rolled their way and what did is a spirit so bright she can't yeah. see life without him. I can tell you I can have the worst day at work and I look forward to coming home every single night because the first thing he does is he'll run down the stairs and say mom and he just runs and gives me a big hug and a kiss and I missed you and I'm so glad you're home and I don't get that at the office. <laughs> In White Bear Lake, students with and without special needs play sports together on a unified team. It helps sharpen their skills, improve fitness, and break down prejudices about job, intellectual disability. And it's this sense of togetherness, community, that helps special athletes and their families. It shows people that they're not any different than any other child. You know, one second. Nice job, Sean. Just like many other students, Sean has big dreams. He plans to go to college, move into a house with friends, and enjoy all that life has to offer, just like any other kid. But to Leslie and any other parent with a child with special needs, it's the outside world that can be the biggest hurdle. The people who don't understand or simply don't ask. Joe Cullen and his wife, Tani, were thrilled to welcome a baby boy into their home in Hearts over nine years ago. Around age two, they noticed he seemed to be closing himself up to the world opening around him and was diagnosed several months later with autism. Since then, Joe has become sensitive to the R word and now understands the lasting imprint it can make. It's so easy to just throw it out casually, not realizing that, you know, that can be harmful and offensive to people. And, you know, this doesn't mean, you know, everyone's just trying to be all PC all the time and, oh, you got to be politically correct, not use this word, but it just seems like there's a lot of other words that can be used. And, you know, not only is it harmful for the parents, but also harmful, obviously, for the kids.
kids and people with special needs. Joe, along with more than half a million people, have officially pledged to spread the word to end the word. And although change does not always come easy, a small and unified army will continue to fight hard. I'd like everyone to stand up and raise your right hand. Let's all pledge not to use the R word. Repeat after me. I pledge not to use the R word. I pledge not to use the R word. What an inspiring bunch of kids and their families. Isn't it great to see how your plunging is making a difference? Freezing was good. It was well worth it. I'm glad it's helping out. Well, I'm glad we do it every year. And you're doing it next year. Not me. In honor of the National Law Enforcement Day, we leave you with a look at how fallen officers locally and beyond are being remembered. Thanks for watching. Tell my father that his son didn't run or surrender. Forty years ago, my brother, a deputy sheriff with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, was shot to death while responding to a disturbance call. I remember that day as if it were yesterday. Like many of your, your loved ones, he died in the line of duty. In the line of duty. Passing through As I rest neath fields of green Let him lean on your shoulder Whether an officer is killed one year ago or two centuries ago, they will always be remembered and honored here at the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial. Tell my father when you can, I die.